Well, hello everyone and welcome uh, to Blogging Theology. And once again, I am immensely uh, privileged to have Professor Dale Martin back on Blogging Theology. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. And it is indeed morning where you are in uh, Texas. Um, Actually, not literally. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. But oh, well, was it? One, 1 p.m. Sorry, you're absolutely right. And it's 7 p.m. here in London uh, in the UK. And um, today uh, we're going to uh, be talking about, or Professor Del Mar's going to be talking about the letters of Paul in the New Testament and why some of them are not by Paul, according to uh, Dale himself and other scholars. And by way of introduction, I just wanted to um, mention this book, Forgery and Counterforgery, the Use of Literary Deceit in Early Christian Polemics by Professor Bart Ehrman, who I understand is a, a friend of yours, uh, Dale. And, mm -hmm. uh, and on the dust cover, there's a wonderful sentence. And this is the first line of the book as well. This is what Bart Ehrman says. Arguably the most distinctive feature of the early Christian literature, writes Bart Ehrman, is the degree to which it was forged. And then he says, the homilies and recognitions of Clement, Paul's letters to and from Seneca, Gospels by Peter, Thomas and James, Jesus's correspondence with Abgar, Jesus wrote letters apparently, letters by Peter, Paul, James and Jude in the New Testament all forgeries to cite just a few examples i like that a few examples <laughs> and on the back cover we have our own dale martin writing a quick review and i'll just mention it because it's very much to our purpose today in this remarkable tour de force bar ehrman provides the only thorough examination of ancient pseudepigraphy and forgery in the english language including their importance for early christianity Though other books on the topic have been available in German, Ehrman's supersedes them all, providing an account that is both scholarly and accessible. This is a masterwork and will be for a long time. And that's by Dale Martin, Yale University. So I've actually read this every single word. It's 600 uh -huh. pages long. It's and so long. Uh, it is very, very long and it's heavy. I know, but it is actually fascinating work, actually, if you can... Uh, read it all full of uh, interesting tidbits of information so so dale t tell us what, what is it about the christian use of uh, the use of literary deceit in the early christian literature how, i'm gonna ask a really simple question here how do you know two thousand years later that texts written back then were forgeries how could you possibly know that well that's highly debatable and there's a lot of different ways i think that will become clearer through the course of our conversation because I will give examples uh, for why I would say, for example, certain early Christian um, letters or books um, are not actually by the person who claim the person that they claim to have been written by. Um, but one of the main things is um, style of writing. If we have, this is the main thing for Paul's letters, for example, if we have, letters or writings from someone that we really believe authentically wrote uh, some lit of literature. For example, most, almost all scholars would say that many uh, writings that survive from Plato were actually written by Plato. But oh. then we have other uh, writings, especially some letters that claim to be letters from Plato that most scholars, Platonic scholars would say were not really written by Plato. And that's the way we deal with Paul's letters. We, most critical scholars believe that seven of the letters in the New Testament that claim to be by Paul were actually by Paul. And one of the best ways uh, to figure out uh, whether other letters that claim to be by Paul were not by Paul is simply looking at the writing style. What kind which of vocabulary? Are, which, sorry, before you go any further, just interrupt, could you just tell us what these seven letters who what they are is what this letter to the romans i think is one of them is authentic yes. letters i think the authentic letters are romans yep i have to count i have to count on my fingers because i sometimes leave something out romans first and second corinthians galatians philippians first thessalonians and philemon those seven so the and rest that, there are, when, that when, leads, when, are not by paul then in other words yes, right. yeah. that leaves um colossians Ephesians, 
Second Thessalonians, and then the three letters we call the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Those are the six letters that scholars will say were not written by Paul. And incidentally, we don't believe they were all written by the same person either. Um, mm. And we can get into why we say that, but the most Thank important, you. the best way to do it is writing style. And this is, right. people can decide for themselves. It's, it is debatable because of course, someone could write in one style at one time and a somewhat different style. Another, they could use one set of vocabulary, one place and another for, for another. But mm. uh, when I was teaching um, and I'm now retired, but when I was teaching, um, the students would sometimes wonder how I could tell when they had plagiarized uh, a section of a paper they wrote. And I would go and, and you know, sometimes I'd get a paper and I could tell, oh, this paragraph was lifted from someplace off the internet. It could have been Wikipedia, it could have been some other thing. And nowadays it's easy to do because we have the internet and you can just load up on a site um, a string of words that you think sound suspicious, suspiciously not like this student's writing. And you can go to the internet and you just enter it in and it'll, you can find where they got it from. Wow. So and there's even software now that people can use to just plug in writing in and the software will tell you whether it's plagiarized. They'll, wow. they'll take you to the source where it really is. But even before that, what ha the way you would recognize is that you'd be reading along in some student's letter and you, and some student's paper, and they sound like an undergraduate. They, they have the certain kinds of, saying, you know, ways of expressing themselves, use certain kind of vocabulary, sometimes make a few mistakes in perhaps grammar or orthography or something like that. And then all of a sudden you'll get to a paragraph and you'll go, yeah. this does not match. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it sounds like it's written by a real scholar. By a professor, yeah, or, yeah, or something, yeah. Professor who is yeah. editors and it's it's gone through a writing process, a modern writing process. So that's the first thing is what writing style. The second thing that's most important is anachronism. If there's wow. something in the text that um, just could not, you, you just can't believe this would come from, say the first century. And this we'll see this when we get to the Acts of Paul and Seneca. Um, I mean, the letters between Paul and Seneca. Um, they just don't sound like anything you would see in the first century, especially by Paul. Um, and I, I can talk about that when we get to it. But uh, if, if there's an obvious anachronism, so for example, in the book of Daniel, um, in the Old Testament, um, we don't know, we don't think any of that came from the Daniel that's mentioned in other places in the Bible, who yeah. supposedly lived way back during the um, Babylonian captivity. But the first several chapters of Daniel seem to be written by one person, and they could they could come from the, the Babylonian captivity period. There's, but then you get to the last part of Daniel, and there's all this stuff about the surrounding of Jerusalem. There's prophecies about Ant Antiochus the uh, fourth. There's of Syria. There's prophecies about Antiochus the third. We called him Antiochus Epiphanes, and he's the one who conquered Jerusalem tore down the temple, destroyed the temple, and um, kind of left Jerusalem in ruins uh, and forbade the Jews from observing the law and circumcising their children. And well, we, it all follows exactly what happened around the years 168 to 164. It's very precise date. So that, that that is really unusual, isn't it, for books of the any books of the Bible that you could date a book so precisely or almost to the month, which is remarkable, isn't it? Yes, the Book of Daniel is that way, and part of the reason is because not only can you say, well, you have to presuppose that this author knows about Antiochus the Third's um, and and his father Antiochus the Fourth. There's a section of it that talks about his uh, battles against uh, the Judeans, but mm -hmm. What happens is that uh, we can even date the time, 164, or rather, because the author um, seems to know about the destruction of the temple, but then his, what he says happens after that. He, he believes that right at that time, the Messiah is going to come back yeah. and then set up the kingdom of God. Well, it didn't happen in case anybody's not noticing. Um, <laughs> the Messiah did not come in 164 or 163. Uh, that's the same way we can date the part of Mark, uh, Gospel of Mark in Mark 13 has Jesus 
also predicting the destruction of the Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. Yeah. But, uh, and, but he, he basically then puts the whole thing right in the year 70 because he knows that the temple has been, has been surrounded and been destroyed, but he thinks that Jesus is going to come back right at that time. Well, yeah. it didn't. Uh, so we say Mark must have been written right around 70. And then you get to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke uses Mark, but then he adds time after the destruction of Jerusalem. It it out. Yeah, yeah. so the era of the Gentiles comes in. The era of the Gentiles, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles. Well, yeah. that shows that he's writing maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, maybe more after he's read Mark. Mm -hmm. So that, is, that allows us, again, to place the Gospel of Luke around the year 80, mm -hmm. uh, or 85 or 90. And so anachronism and dating issues um, are a strong way of finding it. So it's a combination of writing style. Um, sometimes it's a, uh, I would argue that Second Thessalonians can be seen to be a forgery because I would say it, that author uses first Thessalonians. He must have had first Thessalonians in front of him because in the first part and the last part of second Thessalonians, the style kind of mimics first Thessalonians, even to the extent of having quoting actual words and phrases from mm -hmm. first Thessalonians. So he's mm -hmm. clearly trying to set himself up as being Paul. Mm -hmm. um, but then chapter two of second Thessalonians is all himself. The style changes, the content changes. He, whereas Paul in First Thessalonians had said, we won't know when Jesus is coming back. We can, we'll be, be, need to be ready. But the, Paul refuses to give any absolute signs for when Jesus would appear. Well, the writer of Second Thessalonians gives us several signs. He says, this will happen, then this will happen, then you have the lawless man arise. He will, he will set himself up in Jerusalem in the holy place. He will call himself God. And well, uh, this is not Paul. So it's clear that he's got First Thessalonians in front of him and using it as a model, but then changing it to fit his own purposes. So there are ways like that you can see also. Can I just ask about a bit of jargon here? But one of the, the, the words that keeps on cropping up whenever I read about uh, forgery uh, in New Testament studies is this word pseudepigrapher or pseudepigraphy. Um, now, I know what this word means. Could you explain but firstly, what does it mean and why do scholars, well, not you, not by Ehrman, but why do most scholars use this word that is very unfamiliar to the general public? Yes, it comes from the Greek pseudo false epigraphy writing. So it just means a writing that is false or sets itself up as being by one author and is not it's by someone else. Um, and modern scholars have tended to glom on to that word because they're not comfortable using the word forgery for anything in the Bible or for right. early they, forgery sounds like these people are really intent on fooling people. Yes. A forgery That's is someone written by someone who's, who knows he's lying. Yes. And he thinks he's justified in lying, but he's yes. still lying. Yes. And modern scholars would often say, well, in the ancient world, it was different. It was much more common to write in the name of an older and uh, well-known uh, person. So it's, it, you know, they'd say, uh, of course, people were writing in the name of Plato. But, you know, everybody knew that people did this. It was kind of from the school of Plato or from Plato's tradition. And there was no intent to deceive. Well, that's just not true. And that's one of the main things that Bart's book shows example after example after example. The, the, this book examines probably every possible example of forgery in the uh, in the ancient church, uh, and he he shows I think definitively why every example of forgery uh, had it been uncovered when it when it, when some of them were uncovered would have been condemned by Christians would have been seen as an egregious uh, uh, forgery something to be uh, detested and condemned wholeheartedly it wouldn't have been oh well that's okay you were just honouring the memory of so and yeah, so it's and not so. the way they reacted. <laughs> so, the Greek, isn't the there a word, wonderful, wonderful the story? Of forgery is right. nothos, and that's what they'll use. And nothos in classical Greek means a forgery, and it, deception was always assumed to be uh, the motive. And so, when tr 
the act, the letters of Paul and, uh, well, let's say the acts of the gospel of Peter uh, were, were taken by many early Christians to be by Peter himself. In fact, even a bishop allowed the reading of the gospel of Peter in his churches until other people said, this cannot be by Peter. And the, and the reason was that it taught some doctrines that those um, Christians said were uh, anathema or they weren't correct Christian doctrine. So the bishop actually read the work and he decided that it was a forgery and then he prohibited it, it being read in his churches. Wow. Um, Tertullian, uh, there were uh, in the fourth century, there were many Christians who really thought the letters between Paul and Seneca were by Paul and Seneca. And, but um, then some people said, well, no, they really came about in the fourth century. And so they were rejected by other Christian writers um, as not being uh, authentic. So ancient scholars themselves, if they found out something was forged, they not only rejected it, but they said, you can't read this in church. Right. What about three? There's a wonderful story about three Corinthians, Paul's third letter to the Corinthians. Can you tell us about that and how that was discovered to be a, a forgery? Hmm. I actually don't know the story. I know that the... Uh, it was accepted as authentic for many years. It was it, the our earliest manuscripts that contain it are from the ninth century. And it probably, it may have been written in the ninth century, but it got included in the Acts of Paul uh, as part of the Acts of Paul. And that gave it some legitimacy. Now the Acts of Paul is not the same thing as Acts of the Apostles, nor is it the same thing as the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which is another um, uh, Acts writing from ancient Christianity. But um, really, there. Are, I don't know the story of why Third Corinthians. No, I, I, no, I just, I, I think Bart Ehrman told, uh, mentioned it once, if I remember rightly, that um, uh, it's the second or third century, um, a scribe was actually writing Paul's third letter to the Corinthians, and he was discovered by his bishop uh, or, or a senior figure in his church whilst writing it. And, um, and and uh, as you correctly say, you know, he, he, he would have been condemned and he was condemned. But when asked why he was writing Paul's letters, why he was forging it, his apparently his reply was out of love for Paul. Yes, that's that story is true. He he wanted to honor Paul. Yeah, because the third Corinthians do, kind of defends Paul against what could have been charges of Gnosticism. For example, Paul in his authentic letters, mainly in 1 Corinthians 15, argues for the resurrection of the body, but he denies the resurrection of the flesh. Mm. And that's one of the themes of 3 Corinthians. Several times in 3 Corinthians, Paul says the resurrection of the flesh. Jesus was raised in the flesh so he could raise believers in their flesh. He yeah. redeemed the flesh. Well, the historical Paul never would have said that, but if you're a Christian writer, an Orthodox Christian writer, and you want to parry back some Gnostic claims that they claim Paul for themselves because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the flesh either. Mm -hmm. If you're an Orthodox person who believes in the resurrection of the flesh and like Tertullian, you believe that that's the only Orthodox position, well, then you can see how it made sense for an Orthodox writer to think, well, maybe if we had something by Paul where mm -hmm. he is clear that he believed in the resurrection of the flesh. I've got a slightly more controversial question here. I mean, as you say, I mean, over the years when I've read New, New Testament commentaries and, and uh, discussions of authorship uh, about particularly about Paul's uh, pseudepigrapha and say to Peter, second letter of Peter, which is also considered to be pseudepigraphal. The, the, the line of reasoning is, uh, as you said, it, well, it doesn't really matter because, um, you know, at that time in, the, in that place, people recognize you like a, a Petrine school or a Pauline school, and you were honoring the memory of the founding apostle. And so, you know, it, it's still part of sacred scripture. Nothing to see here. Go away. You know, there, there is, it's not an issue. Now, what by Ehrman has done in English and German scholars have done apparently before that is to blow this out of the water. You can no longer argue that because there's no evidence for it. It's like an, an urban myth 
that it was accepted in the early church this kind of deceit it wasn't accepted it was condemned when it was discovered and would and uh, and so on as you say my question is this though what has happened in new testament scholarship since the publication of by ehrman's work and your own work because you say the same thing in your work is this now filtering through or is there still resistance from uh more conservative christian scholars to this very idea that forgeries would be condemned in the early church do you see what i mean most of the conservative scholars just make counter arguments that these things are not pseudepigraphical they'll right. just for example offer other studies of the vocabulary that make that argue well sure the vocabulary sounds somewhat different from paul but all of us can write using different words when writing to different situations in different times we don't always write it exactly the same way they'll just kind of try to show examples of how you could read these uh, documents as being by the, the person that they're uh, that claim they claim to be written by um i think one of the places where a lot of uh, Christian scholars and theologians and people in churches, if they're in the more liberal churches, they'll perfectly accept the arguments that these that many of these documents are uh, forgeries or pseudepigraphies. But they will also make point point out that things that Bart doesn't really, I think, point out. And um, Bart kind of work came out of a more evangelical conservative background, and so when he came to be convinced of these things, then it caused him to kind of give up his faith and become an agnostic. Um, yep. So what do you do about all the theologians and biblical scholars like me? I still go to church. I take these texts to be scripture, holy writings. Well, it's because we have what I would call a more postmodern theological understanding of, of what does it mean to call a text scripture? You don't have to believe that it's scientifically accurate. You don't have to believe that it's historically accurate. And you don't even have to believe that it's by the person that the text claims to be the author. You take it as scripture because you believe, uh, people would say, that the Holy Spirit uh, led the church into, into the making of the canon or the making of scripture. And it was a long process. It took centuries before these 27 writings of the New Testament and only these 27 writings of the New Testament became accepted as canonical New Testament. And we just say, well, we call it scripture because the church says it's scripture. And we uh, believe that if you, the theological answer is that we believe in God. There's no better proof that God exists either. Um, we believe that in the Holy Spirit, there's no proof that the Holy Spirit exists either. Um, and so if you believe those two ridiculous things, uh, then why can't you believe that God could even use forgeries as part of a uh, holy scripture for the church. So we just make a difference between the theological designation of these texts as scripture from the historical designation of them as historically accurate. Those are just not the same kinds of ideas. So use a postmodern post hermeneutic, different levels of understandings of truth to bring all this together. But it still sits a bit uneasy with me uh, uh, as a layman to hear at the same time you use the language holy scripture and then talk about uh forgeries whose very nature whose very existence is intended to deceive the readers and uh, I, 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 I do that do not those two concepts sit uneasily together in no one book? It's it's because you're trying to use a universalizing discourse you're trying to say for example the only discourse that you can use to validate something is modern historiography. And the postmodern position would say, well, that's a valid way of doing it. If what you're looking for is a modern historiographical answer, then you play by those rules. Let's take an easier example. Do you believe that there was a historical Adam and Eve, that they lived in a garden somewhere in what we would call Mesopotamia, and they were the original human beings and the only original human beings? that all of humanity came from. Well, you know, a lot of believing Christians would say, no, that's, Adam and Eve is a myth. It may be a good myth. See, this is what I argue in my theology book, Biblical, the Biblical Truths, is that we need to come up with an idea that there are good myths and bad myths. There's good mythology and bad mythology. It's perfectly willing to believe mythology can still be true in a sense. <laughs> 
In fact, that was what I wanted to, to be the title for my book, Biblical Truths. I wanted the title to be In a Sense, mm -hmm. because nothing was true or untrue unless you tell me what sense you're talking about. Are you talking about the sense of his history? Are you talking about the sense of science? Are you talking about the sense of theology? Are you talking about the sense of mythology? So the story of Noah, no critical scholar believes the story of Noah is historically accurate. But does that mean you just throw it out of the Bible? Mm -hmm. Well, no, because you believe that if it is read as a good myth, it teaches, and what that means is it teaches us something true about God, ourselves, and nature, and the world. Hmm. Okay, I'll give you a say. Well, well, do you think if, if Paul had known, uh, having just written one first, his letter to the Romans, for example, that some, some guy, some dude down the road was forging a letter in his name and actually not representing his teaching accurately either, do you think he would have minded? Of course he would mind. Um, so well, what does that say though about the letters then that uh, bear his name that he you know he's, he's well again you're allowing Paul. You're, you're allowing a historical reconstruction of Paul not a scriptural yeah. reconstruction of Paul not a theological reconstruction of Paul see these are all different Pauls hmm, you're so. starting with the assumption there's only one Paul in all of the universe I am yes the one that historians establish the, yeah the, the the man who wrote you're Romans. allowing you're allowing that is the criterion for judging the value of the document. Well, theologian would say, who, who died and made you God? You know, <laughs> that you get to set uh, the historical construction of Paul as the criterion for what we, what we accept as scripture. Of course, okay, Paul, let, me, Paul let, me you, let me ask you a slightly more provocative. I, I'm not gonna labor this point further. But I, I just find it an interesting discussion. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Professor Dale Martin, th there's a Dale Martin in San Francisco, who, as we speak, is writing a book uh, using your name, claiming to be you, and uh, espousing views which are radically discontinuous with your own views. Would you object? Uh, probably, yeah. But but why? Just, oh, just change, change, your, change your example a bit. <laughs> if if uh, someone was doing this a hundred years from now, I'm dead. And. You know, so what does it matter? I could, it doesn't matter if I would object. I can't object. I'm dead. And so that's the situation we're having. It's not, you're doing these little kind of thought experiments. Yeah. But you're not introducing them to theological rigor because I might not object, for example, if I were up in heaven somewhere uh, and I'm looking down and I'm saying, oh, look at this guy from San Francisco's publishing these texts that he claims were written by Dale Martin, probably I would look at it and say, well, is it for a good end or a bad end? You know, is he making me... Is a bad end? It's a bad end. Navigating things that you don't agree with. Like, the, like, say, the author of Two Thessalonians, who you cited, saying things that Paul directly didn't say or said the opposite in One Thessalonians about, you know, the man of lawlessness and eschatology and the coming... You know, he's definitely, under your name giving views that you find disagree with. Uh, but you, you say, so in that case, Paul, you would in his, in the historical Paul in mm. his life would have objected to that. Yeah. So, so, so that's the point. His name is being used. His no, own. No, 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 you're not. I know the situation you're proposing. Yeah, so okay. what is the question? So what uh, you, you take second Thessalonians and you cut it out of your Bible. Will that satisfy you? It's misrepresenting the legacy or the, the truth about that historical person whose name has been used in the furtherance of other agendas. But you just you just change the rules of the game by using the word historical. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Scripture okay. cannot be judged by modern rules of historiography from a theological point of view. It's got to be right. judged. An interpretation of scripture has to be judged by what, in Augustine's terms, does it promote the love of God and the love of neighbor? Hmm. If the interpretation of this text does not promote the love of God and the love of neighbor, then it's false. It doesn't matter who wrote it. So you can do the same thing with things that Paul said. The historical Paul said all kinds of things that I don't accept as theologically correct. It doesn't matter whether the historical Paul said it or some later creation of Paul said it. I don't judge the text from a modern Christian point of view by whether 
I think the historical Paul said it no more than I judge the validity of the gospels by where they, by whether they correctly record, let's say what a modern camera would record of the life of Jesus. The modern camera recording in some imagination is not scripture. Mm, no. Now you mentioned the four the gospels. Reason that, the reason that, that Bart and people and you, when you talk like this are incorrect is because you have a deficient theology. Right. That's why I've spent a lot of my career trying not only to talk about the history, but then trying to say, now, wait a minute, let's now switch gears and say, what does it mean to think theologically about this? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a new game. And you need to learn to think theological. And then you need to learn to, to read these texts theologically. That's the main point of my last book, Biblical Truths, is that yep. once you've established the historical meaning of this text, you're not there yet. Mm -hmm. If you're a Christian, you have to learn to read it uh, through, his, through a theological lens. And it's no different from saying if you're a social historian, once you've sort of decided about the historical uh, reference of uh, a letter of Paul, you might as a historical exegete say, okay, dust your hands off, I've done my job. Hmm. Well, if you're a social historian, you say, no, you haven't, because I wanna use this text for another purpose. I wanna say, what does this text tell us about the social and cultural history of early Christianity and Paul and Paul's writings. Mm. Well, that's not the same thing as historical exegesis. No. Okay, um, you, you touched on the Gospels there. I think it's an important point to clarify. The Gospels that we have, according to the church, are the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But these are not forgeries, are they, according to you and to quote by Ehrman? They're, they're something else. Well, well, could you just clarify the distinction between a forgery what we've been talking about and what the gospels are and why they're not forgeries in that sense. Yes. And that that's true for the canonical, the four canonical gospels. There are gospels published in the second century that um, I think probably we could count as forgery because somewhere in the text, it tries to indicate that yeah. it was written by say Peter or whoever the gospel of Peter or something like that, but, um, or it was published as actually written by Peter by someone else. But the four canonical gospels, um, the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do not occur, the, or according to Matthew, according to Mark, they don't occur anywhere in the um, ancient documents. Right. They, they start being applied to these documents probably around the end of the second century. You know, they start being applied in the middle, earlier middle second century, but they don't come to be really set until the end of the second century, maybe around the year 200. And then right. you have people like Irenaeus saying the Gospel of Matthew really was written by the Apostle Matthew. The Gospel of Mark really was written by Mark, and he was a, a secretary to Peter, and he wrote Peter's version of the Gospel. And Luke, Luke wrote Paul's version of the Gospel, and John was written by the actual mm -hmm. Apostle John, the beloved disciple of... Well, none of that's in the text of the Gospels. Yeah. So what we call those are not pseudonymous because they don't claim to have an author that is false. We call them anonymous. Anonymous. Right. Anonymous. And that actually that's a, a lot of texts from the ancient world are anonymous in that sense. Um, mm. and, you know, a lot of the Old Testament documents um, mm. are anonymous. Uh, they, for example, the first five books of the Bible we call the Pentateuch. Mm. They circulated most of the time in the ancient world without being ascribed to Moses. Um, now, the, the book Deuteronomy at the very end kind of a, ascribes De Deuteronomy to Moses. Um, but it's kind of odd because it's the Deuteronomy was supposed to be finished and published after Moses had already supposedly died and exactly. been buried by God. <laughs> uh, so then, you know, whoever's writing the end of Deuteronomy kind of predates this. And, mm. But that in, in a lot of later Christianity, they took that to mean that Moses had also written Genesis, Esther, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. Well, Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, they don't claim to be by Paul, by Moses no. or anybody. No. So it would be anonymous also. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Well, the, 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 there is, um, Bart Ehrman mentioned the dust, the dust jacket, but Jesus's correspondence with Abgar, 
So Jesus wrote letters to someone. What on earth's going on there? And why are they for? I mean, I don't know. Jesus wrote letters. This is news to me. So what's going on there? And why are they forgeries? Why, why couldn't Jesus have written letters? Surely he could have written something. Well, it's not that we don't think he could have written something. Um, but if you take what we think was Jesus's educational level, I mean, he was called even by his own followers, agramatos, you know, un, uneducated, unlettered. Um, he may have had some kind of education, but uh, even in our gospels who try to raise his stature as much as they can, he just doesn't come across as having the kind of high education that would have allowed him to write the kind of uh, Greek that we find in the letters of Jesus to Abgar. And here's also where the anachronism comes in. You know, he's writing to this guy who's supposed to be a king somewhere in Syria. And, uh, you know, would a king in Syria of this area, he says, oh, I've heard of all the great wonders you've performed and I want to invite you to come and heal all the people in my kingdom and I'll pay your way and blah, 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 blah. Is that historically really possible? No. Mm -hmm. Jesus no. was an unknown peasant prophet, an apocalyptic prophet, certainly, but not nearly that educated. So again, you use the style of writing. Could the historical Jesus actually write these kinds of letters? No way. They show a level of education that very few people in the ancient world had, maybe one to 3% of the people in the ancient world had. So wow. even if Jesus had something of what people used to call a rabbinic education, a, Jew, a Jewish education, it wouldn't come to the level of those letters. And then we just <laughs> don't think there could have been a king who knew about Jesus and wrote it. The other thing is that, again, anachronism, both Jesus and Abgar quote parts of the New Testament in their uh, lives. You know, <laughs> it's so uh, mm, Okay. <laughs> Slightly anachronistic there, I think. And then um, Paul's letters to and from Seneca, Seneca, the gro re great Roman uh, writer. So Paul was literate, however. Um, I don't think you dispute that. He could read and write part of that 1% or top 5% or whatever. So w w why couldn't he have written these letters? But the better question is, did he? Or why don't you think he did? Well, for one thing, we think they were written in Latin. Um, that's the only way we have them. But they just look like they were originally published in Latin. Um, they may have been written in, say, the 4th century. Because uh, Jerome seems to know about them and he's writing at the end of the fourth century. Um, but we, they just don't look like uh, they were written in the first century. And we have no clue that Paul could speak or read Latin. He claims, you know, he doesn't claim, but the book of Acts claims that he uh, is a Roman citizen mm -hmm. uh, and is a Roman citizen. Then you could say, well, maybe he learned some Latin. But Paul came from the Greek speaking East and in the Greek speaking East in the first part of the first century. Um, people didn't speak Latin. When the Romans went to Greece, they spoke Greek. Yeah. Because nobody would understand Latin. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, even the Romans in the East spoke Greek. Um, so th the chances that Paul around the year, because these letters seem to date themselves from the year, say 56, 58 to the year 64. Because in some of the letters, Paul mentions uh, people who, uh, you know, the consulships of this person and that person, which scholars can date to year 58. Or, and, um, and then the last ones seem to mention Nero and uh, what happened with Nero persecuting. Seneca talks about Nero persecuting the Christians and the Jews. Well, that looks like 64. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, could... A, a Jew like Paul, and I don't think he had a really high education. I think he had a good rhetorical education, but he was not, I don't think he had a philosophical education. Interesting. But that's part of the thing is that it wants to set up Paul as practically a Stoic philosopher. Here he's writing, you know, Seneca, mm -hmm. the most famous Stoic philosopher of the first mm -hmm. century and a hero mm -hmm. to later Christians. Christians like Tertullian claim this is our Seneca. Later, educated Christians wanted to because they admired Christian. Uh, they admire um, Seneca's uh, stoicism, his stoic philosophy, and it looked like the kind of Christian they thought was proper Christianity. Well, it wasn't the kind of Christianity of Paul. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a Christianity that developed when philosophically educated 
highly educated philosophical Christians um, mm. started reading Christianity in the Gospels and Paul's letters through the lens of Stoic philosophy. And so it's clear that they're trying to portray Paul as a good Stoic philosophy, philosophically educated person and Seneca as an admirer of Paul. Right. Now Seneca, it, whoever wrote these letters, doesn't make too much of Paul's education because Seneca even has a little dig every once in a while in these letters about Paul saying, well, you know, you know, your, your Latin is not that great. Um, and I'm going to send you something that will help you in your writing style. Mm -hmm. So uh, whoever wrote these knew that Paul's letters didn't show the kind of writing level that he knows Seneca wrote in, mm -hmm. but he still believe is setting Paul up as writing in very, very good Latin. Mm, right which is highly unlikely mm, mm, and again mm. what are the historical chances that seneca the most well-known philosopher in the first century and the closest advisor to emperor nero <coughs> yeah is writing to paul in the year 58 yeah it's like that king writing to jesus you know what why would these eminent persons possibly communicate with com complete unknown marginal figures on the corner of the roman empire well why would they have this correspondence yeah yeah so it yeah. just they just look like they're written by educated Christians from a later time who are simply trying to, to you know, claim the more respectability for Christianity by making it a bit higher class uh, mm. than it was in the first century. Mm -hmm. Okay, but very, very interesting. Um, I, I think you've already answered this question in a roundabout way, but to, to many people, the idea that the New Testament contains forgeries would call into question whether or not those books should remain in the new testament canon today and uh, from your answer so far obviously the answer was they should remain because they're they're authorized by god uh, through his church and the church has given us this canon of scripture so it's not the individual books it's the canon itself as a complete 27 set work if you like containing 27 books but um, if people have a different theology or different ecclesiology from that, then that would be a real question, wouldn't it? Perhaps a more, well, perhaps not so much a, a postmodernist understanding, a more kind of classical liberal understanding of the scriptures. Then for them, it might actually become an issue whether or not these books should remain in part of, as part of the scriptures, would it not? Yes. And in fact, there have been all kinds of scholars uh, and just normal Christians who's, who said, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't believe that's part of scripture. I'm not going to accept it. So right. some, my mother never did like Paul. Um, <laughs> you know, but why not? Was just <laughs> her problem was she didn't, she was reading first and second Timothy and Titus ah. who say women should shut up and not speak in church. They're subordinate to men. They should yeah. cover their head. She thought that was the real Paul. The Paul ah. from his seven authentic letters is actually not nearly as anti women as the, the later Paul. So, but mom didn't know that she, you know, when she went to church, they just read Colossians and Ephesians and first and second Timothy and Titus as being by Paul, the same Paul who wrote Romans and first and second Corinthians. And so she just, she just didn't, you know, and it's like, you know, a, a black woman in the old South would say, you know, you say, you know, people, slaves ought to be in honor to their master. Well, that ain't, that ain't in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, right, we yeah. say, well, here it is. Uh -uh, it ain't in the Bible. Wow. And they're making that judgment on the basis of what they view as the theologically correct reading. And, and you know, if it if it promotes slavery, it can't be part of Scripture. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's the way people deal with it. Um, but there have actually been uh, critical scholars who wanted to uh, make a different biblical canon. Um, the, the oldest we know about was Marcion, of course, who yeah. uh, write, wrote around the year 150. Yeah. And um, he, he basically said um, that the only gospel that's a true gospel is the gospel of Luke. And even then he edited it so that he took out any good references to Jews because he thought that Judaizing Christians had gotten hold of these New Testament texts and made them more Jewish. And uh, he basically said that was ruining everything. Um, so he chose only the Gospel of Luke in an edited form and the letters of Paul. Um, it's somewhat debated by scholars of which letters of Paul did he include. Yeah. Most of us don't think he knew all of the 13 letters of Paul in our New Testament. Um, but um, he took only the letters of Paul, or those that he thought were genuine mm -hmm. letters of Paul, 
uh, and the ones he knew about. And he, I don't think he ever mentions first and second Timothy and Titus. Uh, and it's probably because most of us, I believe that first and second Timothy and Titus weren't, weren't even written or published until around the year 150 or so. Wow. And if, if, um, you know, uh, you know, Marcion's writing about the same time, he may not have even know, known those letters either. Wow. So, but you know, he was the first one to say, um, we're going to have a criterion and it's going to be the God of the Christians is not the Jewish God. Yeah. The Jewish God, the God of the old Testament is a lower God or even a demonic God. Um, He's not God, the father of Jesus Christ. And so mm -hmm. any text that claims to be early Christian literature that depicts a Jewish God uh, can't be scripture. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he, that was the criterion for which he excluded things. But you have modern scholars also, um, very famously, Adolf von Harnack, um, kind of wanted to get rid of some of the writings in the New Testament because he he didn't like them, he didn't agree with them, but he also claimed, he also believed that they were, uh, you know, pseudonymous and not really written by the person. So, uh, Harnack I mean, Harnack was the, the great German, sorry, I was just saying, he was the great German uh, biblical scholar. Um, I forget, if it was it 19th or 20th century? Was it 19th century? I forget. He, around 1900. He, he, was, 1900. Oh, okay. he was writing in the late 19th and early 20th century. Right. But you see, the, the, this is the, the issue that if you mentioned Marcion, who in the second century was the first perhaps to formulate what we would call a canon of the New Testament. And besides, because he ultimately was excommunicated from the Church of Rome uh, for his uh, bizarre views, you know, two gods, basically, there's a God of Jesus, the real God, and then the God of the universe. And then you had the Old Testament God, the creator God, who, who was frankly not the God he followed. It wasn't the God of Jesus. And so he was ultimately excommunicated. And on the other hand, you've got the other extreme, you've got the Ebionites, uh, who have their own um, scriptures. They have perhaps a version of what we call Matthew's gospel, perhaps not the same, but uh, something like that. Uh, they rejected Paul, of course. They were very hostile. He was an apostate uh, who abandoned the law. So th they had their own, I assume, their own gospel, their own, perhaps their own scriptures, which presumably was the Jewish Bible mostly. And and then you have the proto-Orthodox, as Bart Ehrman calls them, the the the, the religion, the Christianity that we recognize today. So it, it would be possible for other Christians to say, well, given what God has done in our communities as inheritors of Marcion or inheritors of the Ebionite mantle, that we can have our own scriptures and we're going to reject the forgeries that have come to light. So what I mean, so it's it, 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 even on that theological reading, there's still diversity, is there not, with the possibility yeah. of further developments yes um, or, or you could do like the mormons you could just say well we accept the bible but we're going to supplement it with the book of mormon and yes. by supplementing the book of mormon with the for you know with the bible um the book of mormon kind of takes over then and becomes yeah, in some ways doesn't... more important in finality for mormon doctrine yeah. than does the bible so that's yeah. just a way of, we're going to add a second whole text that's just yeah. about as long as the Bible. Um, yeah. But certain, and it's based on the Bible, but teaches other things. So the Mormons had another way of dealing with it. They, they wanted something that would correctly, they wanted scripture that would correctly reflect uh, the developing theology taught by Joseph Smith and, um, you know, his, his successors. Okay. Like, it, um, it, 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 Here's a final question, a bit of a curveball, this one. Okay, archaeologists have just dug up uh, a letter in uh, the ruins in Ephesus, and it turns out they've discovered an authentic letter written by the Apostle Paul to whoever. Uh, it really look, you looked at it. It looks, like, it looks like an authentic letter. We've never seen it before, a new thing to us, and yet it really was written by Paul. Okay, does this get admitted into the canon? And if not, why not? Well, I just come back at a question to you. Who makes that decision in the modern world? Hmm. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question. That's because there is no answer to that question. I mean, you could say, oh, we're going to go to the Vatican. We're going to mm. let the Pope decide. Well, would mm -hmm. the Protestants go along with that? Or do we call a new worldwide ecumenical council of all Christians throughout the world? Well, good luck getting that to happen first. And getting yes. them to agree second.
Do you let each denomination decide? Do you let each individual Christian decide? You know, the, really the way to answer your question is to say, well, who are you going to call? You know, it's like Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? Um, hmm. And it reminds me of a joke we used to pass around in seminary that, so there was an archaeology, uh, an archaeologist in Palestine, Jerusalem, who opened up a tomb and he found this skeleton and through really successful, you know, dating and marks and all this kind of stuff. He proved beyond the shadow of a doubt for an archaeologist that this was the skeleton of Jesus mm. still in the tomb. So he calls up the Vatican. For, he says, well, who am I going to tell this to? So <laughs> among the people he calls up is the Pope. And he tells the Pope, well, I, I hate to tell you this, you know, I hope you're sitting down. But, <laughs> you know, we found him. We're really convinced we found him. And the Pope then scratches his head and he says, oh, my God, I can't I can't decide this on my own. I so he calls all the greatest theologians of the modern world he can find. And, um, you know, he, he says, well, what should we do about this? And they give him different answers. Finally, he gets around to calling Boltmann, oh. <laughs> the great liberal <laughs> yeah. German theologian. And he tells Boltmann the story and there's silence on the other end of the phone. And then Boltmann says, oh, so he actually lived. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Because B- Boltman, of course, is famous for not really caring anything about the, the actual right. struggle of Jesus. Um, and he basically... Yeah, Boltman, Boltman was a Christian. Boltman was... Oh, yeah, he was a Lutheran uh, Christian, no. But, you know, he basically ended the quest for the historical Jesus until later, after his death in the yeah. 70s, 80s, with Borkman and Tom Wright and you and everyone else. Um, E.P. Sanders. So oh, that's, that's, that's hilarious. Uh, that's, that's definitely a, a biblical scholar's joke. <laughs> yes. Um, well, that's fantastic. Well, I think, well, thank you so much, by the way, Dale, for um, the runaround on this, because we didn't just take on forgeries. We spoke about the theology of the, implica- the theological implications of this, if any, um and also these other questions of what what if questions and um because they, they because we, we live holistically we don't live as critical story we, we live as christians as people who are concerned about the truth and about other christians and how we how we respond to archaeological finds and so all these bigger questions have to be asked as well of course um so uh, is there anything dale you want to say in conclusion on any of these subjects to 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 me and to the, the viewers no that's fine. Um, okay. These are these are all important questions, and they have. Mm. Uh, what what I would have been trying to say about how do we approach this, though, from the ultimate meaning of it, is you said we all you know are much more we're much more complex. We we consist of we're, we're historical people, we're literary people, we're modern people, uh, and yet we want to be connected to some kind of ancient past. And if we're Christians, we want to be connected to the entire history of Christianity, as well as the history of the Jews um, before Christianity. Um, I would say that that's one way of thinking of it. That still, in my mind, makes us too unified. It's as if we've got, we each uh, live as one full united person. And somehow we're expected to kind of pull all these things in together and put them in a mixing bowl and mix them all up and come up with the thing that is us. I have more of a, what you might think of as a silo kind of view of the self mm. that we're, we're not one silo. We're a collection of silos. And this, I'm not, I don't mean to say that the, the contents of the different silos never have any influence or contact with one another. That's kind of the way the silo uh, metaphor usually works. So if you get rid of, though, the idea that these things can't influence each other or can't have anything to do with each other. But I think of myself as having, you know, one part of my brain works as a historian. Another works as a scientist, uh, say a natural scientist. Um, So there are just things from the Bible that and even from Christian doctrine that I would just say when I put my scientific person on, I just can't believe that. But that, but see, there's another part of me that's the Christian me. Um, and that can be divided up into the theologian, the Christian theologian, Dale. It can also be put into as the liturgical, 
uh, mm. tale, which is the, the liturgy of the church is important for me. And something to be liturgically good, even if it is possible of bad theological interpretation. Uh, you just have to avoid the bad theological interpretation and keep on using it in the liturgy if you want to. Mm -hmm. There's the ethical part of me that is has a different, and each of these different parts have different criteria to judge what is true. There's no such thing as true with a capital T, truth with a capital T. There are only truths with an S, which is why, you know, the title of my last book was Biblical Truths, mm -hmm. not Biblical Truth. Mm -hmm. So um, that's meant to reflect that there are a lot of different things that we all have of, make, of take, making things true or false. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean collapsing them all into one mixing bowl. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that I think a very beautifully sums up your your whole outlook your, your as you, as you say your postmodernist uh, understanding of uh, the different levels of reality the different truths of reality so thank you very much indeed dale for your time uh, your expertise and your extraordinary knowledge of the scriptures and history and and so on and i'm sure uh, the viewers will find it extremely interesting uh, and, uh, and 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 th thought provoking i think that's what i'm trying to say uh, rather than passively receive knowledge but actually to get to, th to think about the issues that you have uh, so articulately raised so thank you very much dell and um, for your time and um, until next time thank you okay thanks